Chapter 6, Complications. Returning home along the Armadillo Trail, I thought I found a clue to the mystery of our miss missing dragon. The armadillos, those fancy mammals that looked like Sir Galahad in their plates of horny armor, had made a path that came right up to the hammock, then turned abruptly and looped back into the pines. Something in Gumbo Limbo Hammock was driving them off. Since armadillos eat underground insects and insect larvae by digging them out of the earth with long claws and snouts, I concluded it was the saltwater deposit they were avoiding. It must have risen up into the soil and killed the insects. If that had happened, it must have also reached the hole and driven Dajan away. I did not think about it long, however. As I came home around the live oak tree, I saw Mom stirring the shrimp bisque. Her shoulders were slumped instead of straight up, and her head was bowed low. I bolted to her. What's the matter, I asked, fearing my father had found us. I don't think I'll get the job, she said, and I breathed again. Why? I asked. A young man from business school was interviewed today. He'll get it. They always give managerial jobs to the men. Not always, I said. Besides, you can do a better job than anyone. I meant that. Mom does everything well when she has time, including fishing and pitching tents. Liza K. Liza K. She said, pacing before the stove. I've got to have that job. I must get you out of here and into a proper home. This is a proper home, I said. I love it here. I want to stay in Gumbo Limbo Hammock forever. She shook her head and clucked her tongue as she stirred the pot. One important thing did happen today, she said brightly. The social worker called to tell me your father has gone north to a clinic for therapy. I studied her face to see if that was good or bad news. Her face was serene. Then a happy thought struck her. She spun on her toes and took my hands. You and I can start a new life, she said. Home or homeless, fancy job or no fancy job, we have each other without having to worry about your father anymore. She hugged me and pressing my head to her shoulder rocked gently. The pain of those long ago punishments flowed down my spine and out my toes. I hope he finds a nice place to live, I said and I meant it. He was my father. James James did not get back to Gumbo Limbo Hammock until Mom and I were finished eating our shrimp bisque. His appearance was announced by a gasp from Mom. Is something wrong? James James added. You're so dressed up, she said. He laughed, then turned to me. Did you find Asian? No, I said, but I have my suspicions. Salt and our soil and the hole drove him off. I hesitated. It, got, it didn't sound quite reasonable. I thought about it again, but could not come up with a better reason. There is no salt in Gumbo Limbo Hammock yet, James James assured me. I agreed. Certainly it was not in the solution hole. It was fresh as dawn. Any luck with the map, he asked. Yes, I said. I didn't find any underground caves, but I did find three good hiding spots. Dajan was not in number one. Priscilla unknowingly checked number two, and he's not there. And I'm on my way to number three now. What about you? Will the director of the water department plug up the canal, James James? Let me begin at the beginning, James James said. First of all, the director was shocked to hear about the saltwater intrusion and the dead fish. Water is a big issue in this town. The environmentalists are fighting the developers. The developers are trying to get around the environmentalists. And the politicians are hopping from one to another. But fish are dying, I said incredulously. That means bad water for people. I couldn't imagine a director not doing what is good for his community. The situation is serious, James James said. Salt is getting into the condo wells and the town wells. It is, Mom asked. That's a worry. Many people in La Playa are elderly and are on salt-free diets. What can be done? James James wants to close the canals, I told her. The fresh water will back up, sink into the ground where it ought to be, and push down the salt water. 
I'm afraid it's not that simple, James James said. Florida's vast network of waterways affect many special interests like housing, farming, tourism, and wildlife. We get a lot of elderly people in the diner, Mom said, pursuing the salt matter. I guess we should use bottled water. You should, James James said. The town's water's safe for most people, but not for many of the elderly. Hmm, said Mom, and handed James James a cup of shrimp bisque. He gulped a mouthful and smacked his lips. I don't understand why it's not simple, Mom said. Plug the canals and move the people. Water is life. James James put down his cup and opened a satellite map of southern Florida. I'll show you why, he said, and waved his hands across the map. The view of this, the view is from Lake Okeechobee to Florida Bay. Before you lie 14,000 miles of levees and canals. Here we are. He pointed to La Playa and took another swallow of soup, then spread the map on the ground. Look how Mother Nature's plan for the Everglades has been tortured and diverted. He swirled his finger over the maze of canals. Here's how it happened. The Everglades, which is really a slow river, is so rich with soil and nutrients that the Army Corps of Engineers was engaged to drain it for farmland below Lake Okeechobee. The map plainly showed that where once Swampy River had flowed, there were now houses, towns, and farms. They covered many square miles. To drain the river, James James went on. The engineers built these canals going east to the ocean, he pointed, and these going south. They built locks and dams, protected some areas as water conservation areas, and eventually exposed the rich black river bottom. Sugar cane and other crops were planted, and as time went on, the crops were fertilized and sprayed. Nutrients and chemicals came down the Everglades River, around the hammocks, into the sawgrass and sloughs, and the river changed. Weeds grew in the nutrients and choked out the fish. Birds died for lack of fish, and mammals disappeared. The Everglades National Park protects what wildlife remains, but it is losing the battle. I keep this map to remind myself why humans can't improve on a swamp. You change one thing and you change the whole ecosystem. So why don't we just block up the canals and hold the water where it ought to be? Mom persisted from her hands and knees. Maybe we will, James James said. One governor promised to close the canals and restore the natural flow of the Everglades, but he never got any money from the legislators. Maybe the next one will. We can still bring back the Everglades and restore good drinking water. Mom was interested in the salt and asked again what could be done about that. The director said La Playa will have to drill wells farther inland, and if that doesn't work, the town may have to install a desalinator, one of those plants that take salt out of seawater. They are very expensive. For the time being, people will have to stop watering lawns and filling swimming pools. I listened, but all this water talk was not finding Dajan although I did think it would make a good report for Miss Wilson. Right now, time was running out for the dragon, and it was running out for the woods people, too. Many insiders, many outsiders were learning about Gumbo Limbo Hammock. There was Miss Clara Lee Dade, the director of the water management department, and those people from the condos I had heard in the swamp. Very soon, someone was going to find our alligator. A hundred dollars was a hundred dollars, and very soon they would walk into the hammock and find us. James James, I said, interrupting the water talk, if salt hasn't run Dajan out of here and he has food and it's not the mating season, then where is he? James James took a breath and looked at his notes. Something else might have happened to him. There was a large amount of Fentyl chlorophenyl, PCP, and the water sample, he said. PCP is a toxic chemical used as a herbicide to kill weeds and fungus. 
We use a lot of it in Florida. It is primarily a wood preservative. PCP is used heavily in this warm, moist climate to preserve houses, boardwalks, telephone posts, all kinds of wood products, and it's getting into the canal. From where? I don't know, but probably from everywhere. If it's coming from everywhere, said Mom, getting to her feet, why aren't fish dying in all the canals? Why just that one spot? James James shook his head and refolded the map. How do you know it was PCP, Mom asked with sudden curiosity. Years ago, I used to analyze the drinking water for a citizens group in my hometown. Collier County has a lab, so I asked the director if I could go there and test my sample for pollutants other than salt. I found it loaded with PCP, enough to make people sick, retard growth, cause lesions, and impair reproduction in other mammals and birds. That's awful, I said. What's the director going to do about that? At first, he poo-pooed me about its effects. Then I showed him a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service report in his own library detailing the hazards of PCP to fish, wildlife, and invertebrates. He glanced at Mom. Those are snails, insects, crabs. I know, she said, and then laughed. With a daughter like mine, I can't avoid knowing things like that. James James smiled at me and went on. The director was shocked. Then he remembered the county had been using PCP in heavy doses to kill the weeds around the borrow pit to make way for picnic tables and benches. The pit is about 100 yards from where we found the dead fish, Liza Kay. That hard rain a week ago could have carried the PCP into the canal in one flush. Except, I can't quite see how the runoff got past the levee we climbed, Liza Kay, but it must have. The borrow pit, I said. Could the chemicals have washed into the borrow pit? Easily, he answered. Why? Dacian might be hiding there. Slim chance, said James James. Mom got to her feet. Wherever he is, he better be safe. We just have to have Dejan around until we all have good homes and, she looked at James James, good jobs. James James, I interrupted. Dejan really could be in the borrow pit. I unfolded my map. He could get there by going down this wet valley beyond the sawgrass prairie and into the old irrigation ditch in the abandoned tomato field. I pointed. From the ditch to the pit is about 40 feet. He could have crossed without anyone seeing him. He's like lightning when he wants to be. James James rubbed his shaven chin. He did not seem to be hearing me. Want to come to the pit with me, I asked, tapping him on the arm. No, you go ahead, Liza Kay, he said. I told the director I would ask the manager of the golf course if he was using PCP as a fungicide. Hmm, I said and washed my soup cup in the bucket of soap suds Mom keeps for the dishes. I had learned in environmental studies class that soap doesn't harm streams and waterways, so we woods people use soap, not detergents. Detergents have phosphates in them. The use of phosphates have been reduced since it was discovered that they took the oxygen out of the water and killed just about every living thing in lakes and streams. I checked the, deter the detergents in the supermarket to see if the companies really had gotten rid of the phosphates. It's almost true. Some laundry detergents have less than 0.5%, but some still have 5 and 6%. Dishwasher detergent ha detergents have 8.1%. So Mom and I decided soap was best for our hammock. Soap is made of fat or oil, alkali and salt, which don't harm the plants and animals, and you, and the dishes get just as clean. Mom poured a cup of soup for Priscilla, got her towel, soap, and bathing cap, and headed for the lake for a swim bath before sleeping and going to work at 11 p.m. Take the soup to Priscilla on your way to the borrow pit, Liza Kay, Mom called. I turned to James James. Are you sure you don't want to come with me? I'll meet you there when I'm done, he answered. I could tell he didn't think Dejan was in the borrow pit, but I had to be sure. Picking up my map and Priscilla's soup, I started off. It had been a long day, and it still was not done. Priscilla was not in her gumbo limbo tree camp, 
so I left the soup on her table. As I turned to go, I saw that her notebook was open. I shouldn't have, but I turned a page to read the poem. There was none. I flipped on. All the pages were blank. I couldn't believe it. Priscilla was always leaning over that book writing poems. Maybe it wasn't this book. Yes, it was. She had plastered a design on the cover with the sticky leaves of a funny plant called the poor man's patch. I've mended holes in my shirt with them. They don't wash off. The blank pages scared me. Then I recalled that some poets work on their poems in their heads for years before writing them down. That's what Priscilla does, I said to myself, and walked away quickly. The Barrow Pit is on cleared pine land. James James says he gathers kunti there, a starchy, delicious plant the Seminole Indians used to eat like we eat potatoes. As I walked toward it, I thought about Priscilla. Maybe the kids at school were right about her. She was crazy. No, I argued. Priscilla is intelligent and kind. She, like the hammock, is frayed and battered on the outside, but full of good things on the inside. Then I remembered her many bottles. In this preoccupied state of mind, I found myself standing in the abandoned tomato field. It was now covered with weeds. Instead of walking among pines, wild grasses, and sable palms, I was knee-deep in ragweed, morning glory vines, and a pest called Brazilian holly from South America. I stopped still. Priscilla was bent over like a potato digger in the middle of the field. Priscilla, I called running toward her. Your soup's getting cold. I paused a few steps from her. She was tying a mini gin bottle full of red liquid on a bush. The little bottle shone brightly when the sun struck it. Getting ready for the Christmas holidays, I asked, for a lack of anything better to say. Come here, Liza Kay, she said, sinking to the ground, her dusty brown skirt billowing, billowing around her. Sit down. In a moment, you'll see something incredibly beautiful. I sat. A soft whir sounded in my ear, and I felt a cool breeze. He thinks you're a flower, Priscilla whispered. Who, I asked, trying to see my ear. A red metallic light flashed, then a purple-green one. A hummingbird flew over my shoulder, hesitated by my yellow earring, and flew on. It hovered at the mouth of the mini gin bottle, dipped in its long, slender beak, and drank. Priscilla, I gasped, you're feeding the hummingbirds. What did you think I did with the mini and the sugar packet? She frowned at me as if I were accusing her of some evil. Well, I stammered, I just didn't know. Look, she pointed. Five more little hummingbirds hovered over bottles tied to dried weeds and saw palmettos. Trembling with excitement, Priscilla clasped her hands under her chin. Aren't they exquisite? Yes, they are, I whispered as tiny bodies refracted red, purple, green, and gold lights and the sounds of little wings filled the air. At last, I knew what Priscilla did with the mini gin bottles, and it was wonderful. It was truly a beautiful thing. I wish the kids at school could see this. The whir and darting of small wings had distracted me for too long. I jumped to my feet. Priscilla, I said, helping her up, come with me. I think Dajan is in the borrow pit, and he may be very sick. Chapter 6 How does Liza K. explain the blank pages in Priscilla's poetry notebook to herself. Do you agree with her explanation? Why? What other reasons might there be?